I want to take this opportunity to welcome everyone to the Shabbos Shuva Drasha. The Shabbos Shuva Drasha usually offers us the opportunity to come together as United Kehillah, as a community, in the days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, in that sacred Shabbos, during these days of repentance, these days of Tshuva. Of course, this year is a little bit different, and we've chosen to put the Drasha utilizing this online format. But the power of Torah is that it creates a bond between us. The power of Torah is that it links our neshamas together. So even though we may each learn and experience and listen to this drasha in our own homes or in the car or in different places, in Mirat Hashem, the Torah that we learn together should serve as a bond to bring us all together. I want to begin by thanking the sponsors of today's drasha to thank our Talmud Torah sponsors for the month of Tishrei, Stephen, Terry, Zinn, for dedicating all the Shi'urim and drashos this month in memory of their parents, Tzvi Hirsch ben Yosef HaKoyin, Yantel Mindel Bas David HaLevi, Bunim Tzvi ben Chaim, and Devorah Bas Yisrael Yoel. I'd like to thank our week of learning sponsors, Zevin Isabel Greiner, for dedicating all the Shi'urim and drashos this week in memory of Isabel's father, David Levine, David Ben Yitzchak Eli Halevi. To thank our Shabbat Shuva Drasha sponsors, Chaim and Sherry Bauman, for dedicating the Shir in memory of Gary's father, Carl Bauman, Baruch Ben Yehuda, and Sherry's mother, Dorothy Greenspun, Devora Bas Moshe, Maya Hoffman, for dedicating the Drasha in memory of her father, Ruvain Ben Emanuel, and for the health and Hatzlachan 5781 for her and her family, her husband, Avra Ben Yosef. Her mother, Shulamis Bas, ben, Bas Meir, her brother, Baruch Rafa'u Melech Ben Ruvain, and sister in law, Doralimus. We thank Adam and Allison Steinitz for dedicating the Drosh Merit of a Gemar Chasimotor for the entire congregation, and in gratitude to the Bali Tvila, to the Gaboim, for leading us in such beautiful davening, especially under difficult circumstances. Tommy and Judy Weiss for dedicating the Drosh and appreciation of the Kehila for all of the learning. Bonnie Pesakov, in memory of her beloved mother, Be- Be- uh, Betty Pesakov, Bela Bas Yosef, and Devorah Abrams for the de- appreciation for all of the Torah and accessibility to learning. We thank all of our sponsors for their dedication, for their generosity, and for their commitment to our Kehillah. There is a fascinating dynamic that is brought down, sorry, a fascinating dynamic, excuse me, that is brought down in the Gemara Mesechas Yuma, the Gemara quotes the opinion of Rebbe. And Rebbe says something absolutely amazing that at first glance seems to fly in the face of everything we know regarding conventional tshuva. Rebbe writes, this is in Mesechas Yuma, Daf Pei Hei Amud Beis, page 85b. Rebbe writes, Kol Averu Shabbatona, Ben Asa Tshuva, Ben Lo Asa Tshuva, Yom HaKippur Mechaper. Rebbe writes, any Avera you commit, any Avera you commit, whether you went ahead and you did tshuva or you didn't do tshuva, Yom Kippurim Yom Kippur has the ability to atone for those averos. A dramatic concept which becomes known as Itsumo Shal Yom Mechaper. The essence of the day, Yom Kippur day itself, provides atonement. Whether you do anything or not, the day itself has a cleansing, cathartic impact upon the individual. So just my friends, to understand what Rebbe means. What Rebbe says is, therefore, Yom Kippur comes, I decide I'm not getting out of bed. You know what? I'm going to call it in. I'm just, I'm, I'm going to sleep this one. I'm going to take it easy. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. It's been a long week. Long as there is me tshuva. I'm tired of Yom Kippur. I'm going to stay in bed. Granted, I'm going to fast. I'm going to abstain from physical pleasures. But I am staying in bed. Rebbe says, even if you did not open up the machzer on Yom Kippur, even if you did not clap one Hashem Nua, one al even if you didn't do anything on Yom Kippur, itzumo shal yom mechaper. The day itself atones for you. Bein asa tshuva, bein lo asa tshuva, you did do tshuva, you didn't do tshuva, you are sorry, you're not sorry. You thought about being sorry, you decided you're not sorry, you decided you are sorry, you said it, you didn't say it, you thought it, you didn't think it, doesn't make any difference. Yom HaKippur Mechaper, Yom Kippur atones. And the question is obvious. What does this mean? First of all, it flies in the face of everything we know about tshuva. Tshuva, the, pos- the process of repentance, is all about dynamic activity, is all about making change, is all about figuring out a way to live differently, to be different. And here Rebbe says, 
Total passivity works on Yom Kippur as well. Total inaction works on Yom Kippur as well. Even if you do absolutely nothing, Yom Kippur itself atones. How are we to understand Rebbe's position? How are we to understand the power of Yom Kippur? And why should this work? So I want to take a little bit of a journey. The Mishnah Mesech Asyuma, going back a little bit, on Daf Lamed Hay, page 35b, discusses the sacrificial process of Yom Kippur. You know, Yom Kippur was unique because although there were sacrificial processes which occurred all of the time in the Beis HaMikdash, Yom Kippur was unique in that Yom Kippur, everything had to be done by the Kohen Gadol, by the High Priest. Everything done by the High Priest. So the Mishnah describes the frenetic activity, the High Priest running here and running there, multiple changes of clothing for different forms of order, for different sacrificial services, inside, outside, immersions in the mikvah. So the Mishnah says as follows. The Mishnah is speaking about the power, the power, the, the bull, the bull offering of the Kohen. And the Gemara, the Mishnah discusses here, the Kohen would place his hands on the head of the bull and he would confess. He would confess his sins and the sins of his family. And then ultimately the sins of Klaus or the Jewish people. How would he confess? On Hashem. Please Hashem, on Hashem. Avisi Pashati Khatasi Lefanecha and Yubesi. So without getting into all technicalities, but Avon, Pasha, and Chet are all different types of sins. Chet is an unintentional sin, an Avon is an intentional sin to satisfy a desire, and Pasha is an intentional sin with the intention to rebel against the authority of God. So the coin says, Ana Hashem, Avisi, Pashati, Khatasi, I've performed all of these different Averas, and Yubesi. Please forgive all of the Averos that I have committed, both myself and my household. And the Gemara is bothered by something interesting. The Gemara is bothered by two words. Ana Hashem. When we translate it, we know we translate it as, Please Hashem. Please Hashem. So what's intriguing is about the use of this phrase in the first sentence of the coin. Ana Hashem. Avisi pashati chatasi lefanecha. So if you translate it, it says, Please Hashem, I have sinned. Unintentional sins, intentional sins, rebellious sins. And the question is obvious. What is on Hashem? What do you mean, please, please Hashem, I've sinned? Now I understand the next phrase. On Hashem kaperna. Please Hashem, forgive me. Please Hashem, atone for me. Please Hashem, cleanse me. Then I understand the please Hashem. But why is there an Ana Hashem? Please Hashem, I have sinned. Avisi Pashati Chathasi. What's the meaning of that phrase? So the Gemara explains, Minayin Sheba Ana. Why do you use this formulation of Ana? Please Hashem. So interesting enough, the Gemara says it's modeled after Moshe Rabbeinu. That's when Moshe davened for the Jewish people in the aftermath of the sin of the golden calf. What does he say? This is in Shmos, in Exodus, Paraklamid base, chapter 32, verse 1, verse 31. Ana chata ha'am haze chata agidola vayasulahem elohe zav. Hashem, this nation has performed a terrible sin, a grievous sin. They have made for themselves a golden calf. So Moshe said, Ana. Please, please Hashem, the people have sinned a great sin. So because Moshe said Anna for the confession of the Jewish people, we borrow that same Anna Hashem, and the Kohen uses it for his vidu. And the truth is, we use this for our personal vidu as well, personal confession. Anna Hashem, please Hashem, chatasi avisi pashati, I've, I've sinned, asisi kach v'kach, in the verbiage of the Rambam. I've done so-and-so, because according to the Rambam, it's not just enough to confess in generalities. You have to specify what I have done wrong. So we use Anna Hashem. Where does Anna Hashem come from? The Anna Hashem in our vidu, in our confession, comes from the Anna of Moshe Rabbeinu. But it's the same question. Now, I don't understand the verse by Moshe Rabbeinu. What do you mean, Ana chata amaze chata agidola? Please, please Hashem, the people have committed a terrible Avera. Please what? Please what? What, what? what is it that I'm asking? I understand you want to say, please forgive them. Please forgive them. Please, please go ahead and erase the sin. Please annul the punishment. What do you mean, please? Ana Hashem chatasi. Please, Hashem, I have sinned. Ana, chata, amaze, chata, agidola. What's the meaning of Ana? So it's beautiful that the Gemara has shown me a scriptural source for the wording for the Kohen's confession. So I understand the Kohen Gadol didn't make up Ana Hashem. He took it from Moshe Rabbeinu. But the question is the same. Why is that word please inserted into the vidui of the Kohen, into the confession of Yom Kippur? 
And Rabbi Saladichik Zechitadik Livrach in his Alat Shuba advances something incredibly amazing. The Rav writes, and he writes about this extensively, that Shuba, Shuba, the concept of repentance, is fundamentally illogical. It doesn't make any sense for a simple reasons. Every action has a reaction. Every action has a consequence. It's very nice that a person says that they're sorry. Uh, absolutely, of course, wonderful that you said that you're sorry. But at the end of the day, I still did something wrong. So how is it that tshuva, remember the power of tshuva is such that sincere tshuva has the ability to go ahead and erase punishment. Really sincere tshuva has the ability to erase sin. Profoundly sincere tshuva has the ability to convert past transgressions ultimately into mitzvos, into positive deeds, positive acts. How does that make sense? And in fact, Rabbi Soloveitchik writes, he says, It makes absolutely no sense, totally illogical. Even the angels, the angels don't understand tshuva. And as a result, when the angels see a human being doing tshuva, what do they do? They close the gates of heavens. Because they feel, what is this thing, tshuva? You did the crime, you do the time, right? You, you made a mistake, I got it, you apologized, very nice, fantastic. Maybe, maybe that'll lessen the punishment, lessen the severity of the transgression, but that tshuva should erase something? That tshuva should change something from an Avera to a mitzvah? The malachim don't understand it. So when human beings start doing tshuva, the malachim, their natural reaction is close the gates. Seal off the gates. God doesn't need to be bothered with this kind of stuff. You should have been more thoughtful beforehand. Should have been more careful beforehand. It's very nice to say I'm sorry. Very nice to say I'm sorry. Right? How many times does it happen where we have interpersonal conflict and someone apologizes? And of course, you have, you have to be a gracious individual. And it is important to accept people's apologies even if you don't think it's so sincere. But there's a part of me that says, I'm happy you apologize. Why did you do it? Why did you do? Why, why did you have to say that thing? Why did you have to engage in that action? Why did you have to hurt that? I accept the apology. I accept the apology. I believe you that you're not going to do it again. I'm looking forward to restarting the relationship. But why did you do it? So the malachim, the angels, says Rabbi Salavechik, when they hear tshuva, they want to close the gates. Come on. Come on, enough of that. You committed the act. I should have thought beforehand. You should have been more vigilant. You should have been more careful. Now you want to say you're sorry. Very nice. Noted. Noted, right? Silber apologized. Shkoyach. Okay, good. But there's no room for you up here, the Malachim say. Your tfilos again ring hollow because if you were really that concerned, you would have been more careful from the beginning. So what does HaKadosh Baruch Hu do? So it says Rabbi Salavechik, as the Malachim are closing the gates, the Ribbono Shal Olam does something amazing. And he quotes over here the Gemara Mesech and Sanhedrin. The Gemara talks about the idea about King Menashe. King Menashe was one of the longest serving monarchs. He reigned for 55 years. 55 years. And for 22 of them, he was a most heinous Russia. Incredibly evil. Introducing immorality and idolatry in every corner of the kingdom. But then a life event occurred and he decided to make Chama Balchova. And for the last 33 years of his life, he, sing, he, he dedicated himself to HaKadosh Baruch Hu Ta'am Yisrael. He even tried to uproot all of the negativity that he had sown. He was unsuccessful in, in that part. He was unable to go ahead and kind of, you know, rewind. He was unable to go ahead and take back all that he had done, all, all the negativity that he had sown. But on a personal level, he had rehabilitated his self. So the Gemara says that Menashe wants to do tshuva, Menashe wants to repent, and the Malachim say, the angels and the heavenly court say, no way, no how, 22 years, not only did you sin, you know, the Ramam and Hilchus Tshuva brings down that one of the worst things a person could do is not only their own sin, but causing others to sin. Because if you cause others to sin, even if you do tshuva yourself, you can't undo that which other people did. Menashe caused others to sin. And therefore the Gemara says, the Malachim want to say, no way, no how. So what did HaKadosh Baruch Hu do? Listen to the Gemara, Melamid. Sha'asa HaKadosh Baruch Hu kemin machteres barakia. The Rav Shal made a secret tunnel from Menashe. A secret tunnel, a back door, a back door. Menashe, you want to come home. Menashe, you want to come back. Menashe, you want to do tshuva. The front door is closed. The malochim, the angels, they're barricading it. They're barricading it. But come here, I'll show you a secret entrance. I'll show you a back way. I'll show you an underground tunnel. So you too could become a Baal Tshuva. And Rabbi Salavajik says so beautifully. 
He says this is the meaning of the word Ana. What does it mean when we say Hashem? Ana Hashem, please Hashem, Chatasi Avisi Pashati. What am I saying please to? Please what? Please what? And Rabbi Salavichik writes so beautifully, I'll quote to you, he says, Lashon, he says, Ulam ba'ana zura muza utmuna etzma of sharsha chazar betshuva. Im na'azin hetiv, if we listen attentively, when we say that when we say the word ana, we hear the cry, the cry, the heartbreaking cry, al not to choke bifane es hadalas. Do not close the door in front of me. Ana means please, Ribono Shel Olam, don't close the door. Please. I know that I've messed up. I know that I've made mistakes. I know I've done things wrong. And I know that I'm not an episodic offender. I'm a habitual offender. And I know that it's the same thing over and over and over. And I know that I've said sorry a million different times. But Ana Hashem, Please, please don't close the door, even though Chatasi Avisi Pashati Vaasisi Kach Vekach. I know. I've done it all. I've done it all. And I've done it repeatedly. But on Hashem, please Hashem. I know the Malochim want to close the door. I know that the Beis and Shamala wants to close the door. But on Hashem, please Ibn Shalom. I'm asking you. I'm asking you. Don't close the door. Don't close the door on me. Ana al tin al es hasha'ar. Please do not close the gates. Tain li lomar mashu, says the Rav. Allow me to say something, please. Please. Just keep the door open. Don't slam it in my face. Just keep the door open so we could talk this through. So we could talk this out. That's the Ana Hashem. Ana Hashem chatasi avisi. There's a comma in there. Ana Hashem, please. Please just listen. Please just listen. Please just keep the door open. Please just give me a few moments to talk to you. Please give me a few moments to explain. Yes, chatasi avisi pashati. I've done it all. But please, Ribon Shalom, please, please, just keep the door open. But perhaps we could take the Rav's idea a little bit further. That maybe Anna doesn't just mean keep the door open. But Anna, the please means please, Ribon Shalom, don't give up on me. Don't give up on me. Don't throw in the towel on me. Ana Hashem Chatasi Avisi Pashati. Ribon Shalom, I know, I know, I know, I know what I've done. I know what I've done. Chatasi Avisi Pashati, I know it. Because at the end of the day, although I make excuses and I justifications and I hide behind made a pashkafas and isms and everything else, I know, I know what I did. I know what I did. But I ask you, don't give up on me. Anu Hashem, please keep the doors open. Please don't give up on me. I may be a little bit tarnished, and I may be a little bit damaged, and I may be a little bit difficult, and I may be exceptionally rough around the edges. But please don't give up on me. Don't give up hope. Don't throw in the towel. Anu Hashem, please don't give up on me despite... Chatasi avisi pashati. And this is what Moshe Rabbeinu was saying. If you think about this, right? Moshe Rabbeinu says, Ana chata amaze chata agidola. This nation, they committed something so terrible. They built a golden calf. They built a golden calf. And you know, it always struck me that Moshe Rabbeinu, why did he have to repeat that? God knows what they did. We all know what they did, right? The reader knows what they did. We see it in the Chumash. Kashparuch knew it. Moshe Rabbeinu and Klal Yisrael did it. So Moshe, why do you have to say it again? Please, Hashem, the nation sinned a great sin. Um, but they, they built a golden cap. Why do you have to say it? We know it already. Not only that, but what does Moshe Rabbeinu say right after that? Ve'ata. Moshe Rabbeinu makes a little bit of a threat. It's not even a veiled threat. It's an open threat. Ve'ata. Im tisa chatasam. If you will forgive their sin, fantastic. Vim ayin. If you don't forgive their sin. To erase me from your Torah. Psh, erase me from your Torah. Those are, those are fighting words. What, what, are you, what are you, you're threatening God. Klal Yisrael did something wrong. Not HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So what are you threatening God? Elama, it's not a threat. When Moshe Rabbeinu says, Anna, please, Ribbon Hashem, I'm just asking. I'm just asking. Keep the door open. Don't give up on them. Despite the fact that they did 
something terrible. I am not at all negating the fact that this was a heinous, a heinous act. I'm not at all discounting the fact that this was a terrible relationship trespass. I am not at all minimizing the severity of the act. Chata, amazeh, chata, gidol, they built a golden calf. But Anna, please don't give up on them. You can't give up on them, Ribbon Shalom. Because Ribbon Shalom, if you give up on them, then it's only a matter of time until you give up on me, Moshe Rabbeinu. Because I'll also make mistakes. Chalai Yisrael made mistakes. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I'll make mistakes. I'll fall. I'll fail. I'll mess up. And if you're going to give up on Chalai so when they make mistakes, then that means you're going to end up giving up on me when I make mistakes also. And if you're going to give up on me, then just give up on everyone at once. Just give up on Claudi, so the fine. But then just take me out also. Give up on me. If you're going to give up on them, then give up on me. What we ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu in that one word of Anna is don't stop believing in us. Don't give up on me, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Don't give up on me. No matter how damaged I may be, no matter how many mistakes I may have made, no matter how much of a repeat offender I may be, please, Ribbono Shal Olam, do not give up on me. Keep the gates open. Let's talk. Let's dialogue. Let's figure this out. But please, just please, don't give up on me. That was what Moshe Rabbeinu was asking for. That's what the Kohen Gadol asks for. And that's what we ask for. And maybe this is the Pshat. In Rebbe's statement. So remember again, Rebbe said, Rebbe said, Itzumo Shalyom Mechaper. Right? Ultimately, again, it is the Itzumo, it is the essence of the day that atones. Right? Rebbe, it sounds like what Rebbe's saying is, even if you do nothing, even if you do nothing, Yom Kippur takes care of all of your Averas. And that bothers, I mean, it sounds great, but it doesn't seem to shim, it doesn't really seem to gel, to fit with the rest of our hashkafa regarding tshuva and regarding the Yomim no run. It's all about change, it's all about activity, it's all about actions. Not about passivity and somehow the day magically swoops in and goes ahead and takes care of everything. But Elamai, what's Yom Kippur? What is Yom Kippur? The Pasik itself says about Yom Kippur, Ki ba Yom aleichem letar eschem mikol Hashem titaru. Yom Kippur is the day of forgiveness. Yom Kippur is the day of atonement. Yom Kippur is the day that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to us, I'm not giving up on you. I'm not giving up on you. At times I may be disappointed. And at other times I may even be upset. And other times I may be disenchanted. But at the end of the day I'm not giving up on you. And what's the proof that the Ribbono Shal Olam does not give up on me? What's the proof? Yom Kippur. That every single year built into our calendar is a day of forgiveness, a day when HaKadosh Baruch Hu is willing to listen, a day when HaKadosh Baruch Hu keeps the gates open. And by the way, not only does He keep the gates open, He keeps the gates open even later, right? The whole tefillah of Ni'ilah, the Bosham is the gates are closing, keep them open longer, and He listens. The entire essence of Yom Kippur, the message of Yom Kippur, is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu whispering into our ears and whispering into our souls, I believe in you. I believe in you. And I'm not throwing in the towel on you. No matter how much you've done this year or how much you haven't done this year, no matter how many missteps or mistakes you have made, I am not giving up on you, my beloved child. That is the essence of Yom Kippur. And that's Rebbe's statement. What Rebbe tells us is, Yom Kippur, Itzumot Shul doesn't mean that Yom Kippur has some type of magical quality that wipes out every Avera if I do nothing. But it is the essence of the day that gives me the confidence to talk to my father, to make a plan for change. Because ultimately, Yom Kippur tells me that he believes in me. Yom Kippur tells me that the Ribbon Olam has not thrown in the towel on me. And when I am armed with the knowledge that my father believes in me, there's no telling what I could accomplish. That's Itzumo Shal Yom Mechaper. It is the essence of the, the fact that there is a Yom Kippur, a day in which Hashem tells us, I am ready and willing to forgive you. I am ready and willing to atone for you. I am ready and willing to start again. Wow. Ribbon Shalom, so you mean you believe in me? 
You mean you believe in me even though I've messed up? You mean you believe in me even though I haven't made of my life what I wanted to? You mean you believe in me even though I haven't actualized my potential yet? You mean you believe in me despite the fact that I still haven't honored the promises from last year? And the Kaddish Baruch answers with one simple word, yes. Yes, I believe in you. And when I know that my father believes in me, that gives me the confidence to change. That gives me the confidence to do tshuva. That gives me the confidence to turn things around. Itsumo shayom mechaper, the essence of the day atones, is not some type of magical idea that Yom Kippur comes in and just wipes everything clean with no action on my part. But the essence of the day, the fact that Hashem says, I'm willing to forgive you. I'm willing to start again. I'm willing to give you another year tells me that He believes in me. And if He believes in me, then I have the confidence, then I have the strength to achieve kapara, to achieve atonement, to start again and to lead, more, lead a more meaningful life. You know, sometimes, just speaking openly and honestly, sometimes it's hard to open up the machzer on Yom Kippur. Sometimes it's hard to open up the machzer on Rosh Hashanah because it's like deja vu, but not the good kind of deja vu. Because I find myself saying, I'm sorry for the same things. I don't understand. How could it be that I'm not getting any life traction? How could it be that I'm still struggling with the same things? How could it be that the same pages that were soaked with tears from last year because they represented something that I really felt was broken in my life, they still haven't dried this year? I'm crying over the same Averus. I'm saying I'm sorry for the same things. I'm apologizing for the same dysfunction. And nothing's changing. And so sometimes when I have this, and I think we all experience this in different ways, I say, you know what? Maybe it's just not worth it. Because if I can't get my act together, if I can't get my life together, if I can't get myself together, if I can't believe in me, then how does HaKadosh Baruch Hu believe in me? So comes Yom Kippur. And dear friends, if you close your eyes and you open your ears and you open your heart, you hear that divine voice, the called the Mama Daka, the soft whisper that just says, my child, I believe in you. What words does a child want to hear more from a parent than those three simple words, four words, I believe in you. That's what each of us wants from our parents. And we all know that is the hallmark of good parenting, to that your children know that you believe in them. The Ribbon Shalom gives us a day where the entire message he tries to convey to us is, I believe in you. Come on, you can do it. And even if you're in the same spot this year as you were last year, which was the same thing as the year before that, as the 15, as the 20, as the 30 years before that, this year could be different. I believe in you. I believe in your ability to make something of yourself. I believe in your ability to transcend your current situations. I believe in your ability to escape the shackles of mediocrity. I believe in your ability to actualize your potential. That's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu whispers to us in Yom Kippur. The proof to that is Yom Kippur itself. Why else would the Ribbono Shal Olam give us a day where forgiveness is possible? if he didn't believe in us. Forgiveness is the greatest gift. It's a gift in our human relationships, the ability to start again, the ability to turn over a new page, turn over a new leaf, the ability to rehabilitate that which is broken. HaKadosh Baruch Hu only gives us the possibility for forgiveness because he believes in us. So we say, Anna, my father, I have one simple request. Don't stop believing in me. Don't give up on me because the moment that you give up on me is the moment that I give up on myself. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says back, my beloved child, I will never give up on you. The Haraya, the proof to that is Yom Kippur. It comes every year. Whether you had a good year, you didn't have such a great year. The possibility for forgiveness is there, which means that the divine belief in each and every one of us is ever present. And the truth is, this is not just the theme for Yom Kippur. 
This is the theme for the Yom Im Noram. You know, one of the things I've always found striking is the Kriya Satora, the Torah reading for the first day of Rosh Hashanah. So, it's reading, so remember, the first day of Rosh Hashanah is Vashem Pakadah Sarah. Hashem remembered Sarah for pregnancy. So, we know the reason we read that on Rosh Hashanah is because the Gemara says, Sarah, excuse me, Sarah Menu was barren for many years, and on Rosh Hashanah she became pregnant. She was, she was remembered for pregnancy. So because Sarah was remembered for pregnancy, therefore we read the section of Hashem Pakara Sarah, Hashem remembered Sarah for pregnancy on the first day of Rosh Hashanah. But what's interesting is the Kriya doesn't just stop there. It doesn't just talk about the, you know, the pregnancy of Sarah and the birth of Yitzchak. But it goes on into great detail regarding the story of Yishmael. Right? And how the Torah speaks about the idea that Yishmael, that Yishmael grows up and Sarah is very unhappy with the way he's living and the actions he's engaging in. And so Sarah says to Avram, you have to send Hagar and Yishmael away. Avram, of course, at first is very resistant, but he listens to his wife, because Chesh Baruch Hu tells him to, and they send away Hagar and Yishmael. You know the story. They're in the desert. Yishmael's dying of thirst. Hagar sent, puts him underneath one of the thorn bushes for him to die under the shade. And the miracle occurs. The Malach shows Hagar there's a well. Yishmael is brought back to life. He's rehabilitated. And then they go on with their lives. The Torah says, that after this entire episode, they settle in the desert. Yishmael grows up. He's in the Midbar. They go ahead and they live in Midbar Paran. Okay, that's the end of the story. And it's very striking. Why is that here? Why, why, why is that story here? Or is, why, why does Yishmael get so much airtime? Why does Yishmael get so much attention on Rosh Hashanah? A difference I want to share with you an incredible Yalkut Shimoni. The Yalkut writes as follows. I'm going to quote it, some of it inside, some of it outside, because it's a truly dramatic Yalkut. So, I'm sorry. Yishmael gets married, and he marries a woman. Her name is Asiya, or Asiya. That was her name. Three years go by, and Avram Avinu wants to see his Yishmael. You see, Yishmael was Avram Avinu's son. Remember, even though Avram sent Yishmael away, he didn't want to send Yishmael away. It's only because God intervened and Sarah demanded it that he, he acquiesced. But remember, if you go back a little bit, when Hashem announces, when Hashem tells Avram that he and Sarah are going to have a son, do you remember Avram's response? Remember Avram's response? Lu Yishmael Yichya Lefanecha. His response was, just like Yishmael live. What, what does that mean? Hashem just told you you're going to have a son with Sarah. And your reaction is just like Yishmael live. And Hashem Shunel for her, she says something absolutely astounding. He says, Avram said to God, God, thank you, but I don't need another son. I have a son. His name is Yishmael. Can you just help me with him? Why, why can't he be my spiritual heir? Why can't he be the perpetrator of the Abrahamic legacy? Why do you have to make a whole miracle that a 90-year-old woman, a 100-year-old man have a, have a son? I have a son. Avram loved Yishmael because Yishmael was his flesh and blood. Yishmael was his son. So he sends him away. Three years later, Avram wants to go visit Yishmael. But the Alkut writes, Sarah Imenu was very much against it. She thought it's not good. And understandably so, Yishmael is not your future. Yitzchak is your future. You need to focus your attentions here. So they finally reach an agreement. Avram so Sarah says, fine, you could go, but you are not allowed to get off the camel. So you can go, you can visit Yishmael a bit, say hello, give him a shalom aleichem, but you can't stay. You have to stay, you have to stay on your camel. Okay, so what happens? Avram Avinu goes, he travels to Yishmael. So he shows up at Yishmael's home. It's the middle of the day. Knocks on the door. says, is Yishmael home? Now the woman, it's Yishmael's wife who answers the door, Avram's daughter-in-law. Presumably she doesn't know who he is. And he says, is Yishmael home? And she says, no, he's not home. He went with his mother to go gather fruit from the desert. Avram says, okay. Avram said, you know, I came from a long journey. Do you have any bread? Do you have any water that you can give me? And she said, no, I'm sorry. I'm really aimly lo lechem below mayim. Sorry, I have nothing to give you. Very inhospitable woman. So Avram says, okay, can you do me a favor? Can you go ahead and just leave a message for Yishmael? Tell Avram stopped by and tell him that he should really go ahead and change the threshold of his home, for it is very not befitting of him. Avram Avinu was dispatching a message to his son, a coded message. The threshold of the home is a wife. A woman is the threshold of the home. She is the Iker, the Akera Sabai, the cornerstone of the home. And Avram said, Yishmael, you came from a home of chesed, you came from a home of kindness. 
this woman doesn't embody our values. Yishmael comes back. He hears that a man, Avraham, came to visit him. He goes ahead and he hears the message. And the Medrash relates, the Medrash relates that he told his mother and his mother took for him a second wife. This second woman who was from Hagar's family, her name was Fatima. So Mishmael marries again. Another three years later, Avram decided once again, I have to see my son. I haven't seen Yishmael. Now it's more, it's more than six years now. I'll have to go see my son. Once again, Sari Minu is resistant. They reach an agreement, fine, you could go, but you can't get off the camel. Avram travels to, Yitzchak, to, to Yishmael, excuse me. He knocks on the door. He says, excuse me, is Yishmael home? And once again, again, wife opens up. Not the same wife. This was Fatima's second wife. It's is Yishmael here. And ultimately she says, no, he's not here. I'm sorry. He's out gathering produce from the desert. Miat hotzia v'nastnolo. So what happens? But she says to him, you must be tired from your journey. So she brings out bread. She brings out water. And Avram Avinu has something to eat and drink. Listen to the magicians. He says, Amad Avram, Vahayim Spala Lifnea Kadush Baruchu Albino. Armavinu stood by the entrance of Yishmael's tent and he davened for his son. He davened for his son, the son that he had to kick out of his home, the son that he had to exile, now the son that he hadn't seen for six years. And he doesn't know the next time he's going to make it back, not make it back. Armavinu was already an older man. So I don't know if it means that he dismounted the camel in defiance of Sarah or he just stood still on the camel. But he davened for his son. And miraculously, Yishmael's home became filled with money, with blessing, with material wealth. And then Aram leaves. Yishmael comes home and he sees the home is filled with light. The home is filled with money. The home is filled with material possessions. Yishmael says to his wife, what happened? She says, I don't know. This man, this man came. He asked for you. I think his name was Avram. You weren't here. I gave him some bread. I gave him some water. And he davened. His wife told me everything that happened. And in that moment, Yishmael knew how much his father loved him. Kirachim avabanim. Just like every father loves his children. In that moment, Yishmael knew how much his father loved him. Do you want to know why we read this section on Rosh Hashanah? Why we read the story of Yishmael and Rosh Hashanah? Because everyone thinks the story of Yishmael ends. When Yishmael is exiled, Baruch Hashem is healed underneath the thorn bushes. He gets married and he goes on. And that's the end of the story. But it's not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story. Because the father never gives up on the son. Because the same father that said to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Lu Yishmael Yechia Lifanecha. Just let Yishmael live. Just let Yishmael live. Just let Yishmael be the one. Let him be the chosen one. Avram didn't give up on his Yishmael. Even when HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, No, that's not the way it's going to work. Your future is not just about you. Your future comes from you and Sarah. So it's got to be Yitzchak. So Avram, of course, accepted that. That was the, that was the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But he never gave up on his child. He never gave up on his Yishmael because a father never gives up on his son. That's the Kriya. That's the Torah reading for Rosh Hashanah. A father never gives up on his child. And Avraham never gives up on a Yishmael. And the Ribbono Shal Olam never gives up on us. You see, so many times we go through life and we think that we're damaged goods. And if we don't articulate it deep down, we feel it. And often, even if we don't articulate it, or even if we don't actually or like consciously feel it, we lower the expectations for ourselves. We become content with coasting. We become content with just being the same because deep down, do you know why people really settle for mediocrity deep down? Do you know why? At the end they settle for mediocrity because they don't really believe in themselves. A lot of times people are just happy to live on cruise control because deep down I really don't believe that I'm capable of any more. I don't believe that greatness is actually in my stars. But comes Yom Kippur and the Ribbon Shalom tells us, I believe in you. 
comes Rosh Hashanah and we learn about it in Avram that never gives up on a Yishmael. And a Yishmael who feels the love of his father, albeit from a distance. And how, what an incredible metaphor that story is. Because so many times, father and son, just, they just miss each other. They just miss each other. Adam Avinu comes twice in six years, and both times, both times, his son is not there. And how many times does a Kaddish Baruch Hu reach out to us? I'm not home. I'm in the desert collecting fruit. I'm just not available right now. And sometimes it works the opposite. Sometimes I feel like I reach out to Hashem and I feel He's not there. Sometimes the father and sons miss each other a little bit. Sometimes they're not on the same frequency. Sometimes they're not on the same schedule. But just because they miss each other never believe, never means that they give up on each other. I don't know if Avram ever saw Yishmael again. I don't know. I don't know, it could be that when, he, that when he was exiled from the home, maybe that was it, he tried twice, maybe they never saw each other again. But one thing is clear, which is Yishmael heard his father's voice in his heart and in his ears ringing and saying, I love you and I believe in you. And that's the voice of the Riban Shal Olam that we have to hear as well. He loves us so much. He believes in us so much much. And that is why we have a Yom Kippur. You only get a day of forgiveness because your God believes in you. You only get an opportunity to start again because your Father believes in you. The Anah Hashem, please HaKadosh Baruch Hu, just don't throw in the towel. Just don't give up on me. That tefillah is answered every single Yom Kippur. So as we go into this Yom Kippur, Shabbat Shuvah Yom Kippur, we have to try especially during Yom Kippur itself, to take an opportunity just to close everything else out. You know, this is a, this is a complicated Yom Kippur, and sometimes people are davening inside or outside, or smaller minyanim, yard minyanim, masks, social distancing, like there's so much stuff. And for some of us, you know, some of our children can go to shul, some of them can't go to shul, some of us can go to shul, some of us can't go to shul. There's so much, so much going on. I will tell you just on a personal level, you know, like Rosh Hashanah, Baruch Hashem, we have three different minyanim in our shul. I feel like I spent most of the time running around and I didn't have the davening that I really wanted to have or could have had. I could have had it if I tried harder, but, 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 but I didn't. It, it's, there's a lot of bahala, there's a lot of confusion, a lot of back and forth and a lot of movement in these days. But we have to take the opportunity, even just for a few moments, close your eyes, still everything around you, and just listen, listen. And you will hear the call to Mama Daka that says, I believe in you, my child. I love you. You said, Anna, please don't throw in the towel. And I'm telling you, I will never throw in the towel. It doesn't matter how badly you mess up or how badly you fail. I will never stop believing in you. That's Yom Kippur. And if HaKadosh Baruch Hu believes in us, how much we have to begin believing in ourselves. Let's really believe in ourselves. You know, we often like to say that we could be anything we want, but we don't really believe it because I say to myself, well, I can't really be anything I want. I can't be an astronaut. I can't be a basketball player. I can't be... That, that might be true. That might be true. But on the ruchni, on the spiritual level, you could be whatever you want. There, your height doesn't matter. There, you know, your physical agility doesn't matter. Even your intellectual capacity doesn't matter. In the world of ruchnis, in the world of spirituality, you can make of yourself whatever you want. The sky is the limit. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu believes that you can become something great. HaKadosh Baruch Hu believes that I can become someone great. He believes in us. Let's use this Yom Kippur to begin to believe in ourselves. I hope that Amir Hashem we will each be privileged to hear the whisper, the whisper that says, I love you. I believe in you. When we get that whisper, take it. Savor it. Say thank you. Because Yibam Shalom, you've now given me the koach to believe in myself. And if we make this a year of believing in ourselves and accomplishing great things, then maybe we'll be zochet to hear another whisper, another kol de mamadaka. The whisper of Mashiach, the whisper of Gula, 
the whisper of it's time to come home and be together with your people, with your land, with your Mashiach, with your Beis HaMikdash, with your God. May we be Zochem Yaretz Hashem to hear that whisper. Mhir Rabbi Amenu. Amen. Wishing everyone a beautiful Shabbos Shuvah, a good Shabbos Kodesh, and a Gemar Chasimah Tovah.